Well, hello, Grand Valley. Aren't you a good-looking group of people? <laughs> what have you been up to? You been to the gym? Or is it, does it have something to do with having to fight that wind? Oh, hearty people up here. Oh, look at you. You can't even, you're still in your little scarf and hat. Oh, <laughs> you're making me cold. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for this invitation and for these lovely introductions. Because I get introduced a lot by a, a lot of people, and I don't think I've heard people really understand what I do to this degree. <laughs> so you're a, an associate vice provost, for, and you use the word oppression or something in there. They don't usually do that. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, today, I'm going to... This is my, uh, my topic here. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Lessons from black feminism. And as you were entering and seated, you perhaps had a chance to listen to some of the lyrics and see the video. We're going to come back to that a, a tad later on. But that was Sweet Honey in the Rock singing a song called Ella's Song. And this particular song is the inspiration for my talk today. I want to start off by saying that my talk is Lessons from Black Feminism. It is grounded in black women's experiences. It is targeted to speaking to black women's issues, but it is not just for black women. This is a talk that argues that when we ground our ideas and our actions in groups like black women, we really do approach universal and very important things. So we cannot ignore the particular. Are you all still there? Now, I'm going to read a little bit. I don't do the, read that much usually. I'm going to, tonight, I'm going to do total multimedia. It kind of depends on what I feel like doing. So it, it, we'll, we'll see how this goes. You need to know that I love the question and answer period, all right? So that as I go through my argument, I want to give you the contours of the overall argument. And there may be places where I jump, depending on um, how things are going. If you look like you're going to fall off the seat and fall asleep, I'm just going to say, OK, we're going to skip that part, all right, and move on. Uh, so the the pacing of this will depend on a variety of things. But tonight, I really did bring a talk that I want to read. And I'll go back and forth between reading and my PowerPoint, and uh, perhaps a bit one more you know, bite of the apple on the internet. So you ready to go? There's a line in We Who Believe in Freedom Cannot Rest that says, until the killing of black men, black mothers' sons is as important as the killing of white men, white mothers' sons, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. So I don't know if you heard that line, but that's one of the many lines that they sing. We'll be dealing with this particular song as text tonight. The February 12th, 2012 death of Trayvon Martin in Sanford, Florida, could easily have been overlooked as yet another loss of a young African-American man to gun violence. We've heard that story so many times that it's rarely front page news anymore. Yet his particular death became noteworthy when users of social media launched a highly successful organization organizational effort to shine a spotlight on the seeming injustice of the shooting. To Martin's supporters, the facts seem clear. Zimmerman was guilty because he shot and killed Martin. Zimmerman had a gun, and Martin was unarmed. Trayvon Martin became an icon for being the wrong color and gender in the wrong place and at the wrong time. A rebuttal to mainstream media frames trumpeting colorblindness in everyday treatment and opportunities as evidence of our fairer post-racial society. His outraged advocates saw him as an innocent victim of a more genteel racism that identified even speaking of race as somehow fostering racism. In this context, George Zimmerman had a right to stand his ground and under cover of self-defense take down any perceived threat. Now, beyond showing the power of social media to impact national debate, the Martin case also highlighted a fledgling coalition among diverse individuals whose involvement may have signaled their unease with the apparent social injustices that surrounded them. In this case, protesting Martin's killing went beyond current efforts to cast racial protest as the pleadings of African Americans for special treatment. Oh, that's a black issue you all understand. One could understand young black kids standing in solidarity with Trayvon Martin, but white kids standing in solidarity? What was going on here? Choosing to wear hoodies in solidarity, whites, Latinos, women, the educated, immigrants from Eastern Europe, and people from all walks of life joined in. I even was introduced by a woman, a faculty member, who was from Eastern Europe, who poured a hoodie on, introduced me in her hoodie. This was really interesting. Hello, we have you tonight. I was like, whoa, what is going on? 
around here. This traveled in ways that were just fascinating. He's still there. The hoodie functioned as a symbol of recognition whereby those who opposed racism, sexism, heterosexism, class exploitation, and unjust treatment based on age, ability, and citizenship could find one another. This event seemingly provided a golden opportunity to build political coalitions that might tease out the interconnected power relations of race, class, gender, sexuality, and citizenship status that placed both Martin and Zimmerman in the situation that shaped their flawed perceptions of one another. The July 13th, 2013 verdict stunned everyone. Zimmerman was acquitted of second degree murder and manslaughter charges. If the facts were so clear, how did that happen? More importantly, what does it mean? The political challenge for those of us who are involved in social justice work lies in maintaining a delicate balance between the struggle to keep going in the face of limited victories and repeated failures. We know that struggles for social justice, especially those characterizing African-American freedom struggles, are marked by tragic deaths like Martin's. Yet they are characterized by periodic surges of interest by the general public that can recede all too quickly into a more jaded view of the status quo. Why should we try if we're always going to fail, if the courts don't give justice, if it doesn't work out? Let me go get a drink. Let me go shoot up. Let me go watch TV. The dead kind, not the good stuff. Let me do all these other things. When it comes to social justice work, the true test lies in how we respond to defeat, not how we celebrate victories. In this regard, we have much to learn from black feminism. The ever-evolving view of African-American women who, as mothers, lovers, friends, daughters, and sisters, have far too often grieved the loss of the young men in their lives. Many have been forced to witness the violence targeted toward their children. Sadly, many experience violence themselves at the hands of the very men they love who bring the anger and violence of the street home to their loved ones. The bullet took Trayvon Martin's life, but an unjust society created the conditions that made that bullet possible and comprehensible. The refrain in Ella's song, we who believe in freedom cannot rest, speaks to the specificity of black women in this ongoing struggle, yet it also invokes something much bigger. Now my talk today, are we all still there? I just love my opening, I had to read it. You see why I did? I mean, I really did, you know, it's sort of like, yeah, all right, I can move on. All right, that's for me. that was for me. Now, I don't know what that did for you, but that did a lot for me, all right? <laughs> my talk today is in three parts. And what I want to do is draw from black feminism some core ideas that I think uh, are not necessarily unique to black feminism, but have been made very visible by black feminism and by black women who have raised a certain set of concerns most forcibly. Now, what we are in a period of time where the ideas, if they are good, can easily be, it can be forgotten that black women were central to raising these ideas. It's a very interesting thing to be a drum major for social justice and have one's name erased from the historical record with someone else getting the credit. You okay on row two in the plaid shirt? How are you doing over there? Look at you. Because <laughs> I looked up and he looked, I looked up and you looked a little, oh, oh, oh. so I wanted to know whether, okay, now I had to stop and just, I, I love my student here, all right, you know, kids come out, I, I, plaid shirt, my man, all right. <laughs> but we are dealing with, so we're dealing with tough stuff tonight. You know, I mean, why, why come and just sort of have you all smiling and happy? I want you smiling and happy, but I want you to engage big ideas. And this is the way I've decided to go about it. So the first part of, my, of the talk talks about black feminism as a, as a critical knowledge project. It's not enough just to know stuff, just to accumulate knowledge and walk around saying, I'm so smart. I just know all this stuff about fill in the blank. What does it mean to have a knowledge project that is critical of society, that is critical in the sense of being analytical about the conditions in which you are situated? And I would argue that intersectionality as a framework initially 
was such a knowledge project, and it still is in many places, but this is what is being fought over. So I want to go back and look at black feminism as a critical knowledge project and talk about that, uh, specifically focusing on intersectionality. Then I want to move on and talk about black feminism as a social justice project. And this is the whole notion of, uh, the first part was we. The second part is we who believe in freedom. So I want to focus on freedom, the meaning of freedom, what it means to believe in something bigger than you, what it means to be part of something that is bigger than you, where you are not just an individual floating around from place to place trying to figure out, what is this all about? You see a place in something bigger. And that's an aspirational politics that I think comes from black women. And it has been organized around the idea of freedom and around the ideas of freedom struggle and education in particular. So for that particular part of my presentation, I want to focus on that. Black feminism as a social justice project that has been organized around ideas for freedom. The third part I want you to help me with a bit more. Uh, and this is black feminism and the ethics and dignity of struggle. This is the whole notion of we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. What does it mean to believe in something so much that you know this is what you're committed to for the rest of your life? You cannot rest because you cannot imagine that happening in your lifetime. Does that mean because you cannot imagine it happening that you just quit and say, well, that's not going to happen. I'm going to do something else. Or do you say, cannot rest until it comes? And I think this whole concept also has been central to black feminism and has been central to the struggles of oppressed peoples around the world, to be perfectly frank. Even though it has taken many, many different forms, the whole notion of the inability to rest until it comes that is connected to the struggle for freedom, that is connected to something tangible of seeing one's own child eaten alive. That's something you can't give up on easily. Okay, still there? I didn't know I was this impassioned tonight. It's something about the cold. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was pretty mellow until the plane landed. You know, I was just sitting up there. I was there and the usher scream. You know, I was enjoying that. And then I was listening to what is this girl who sings, you know, the royal, what does she sing? I love that, Lord. I'm just, I'm on that for a couple of times. And then I went down memory lane and I was just going to blend, you know, what is it, blurred lines. I like that one, you know. Then I had my inspiration. So I had my little, you know, my little, it was old school. I, I admit it, a lot of it was old school, but I was pretty mellow. I didn't anticipate that I would be this fired up. But there's something about hearing that song until the killing of black men, black mothers' sons is as important as the killing of white men, white mothers' sons. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes because that is the essence of intersectionality. It says you cannot just worry about the killing of your children. You have to think about the killing of other people's children. And if you really want your children to be safe, you have to keep going down that path in terms of thinking about the connections between your child, your son, young people, your girls, your daughter, your ethnic group, your religion, your sexual partner, whatever it may be. That's the connectedness. There it is in that one little line. So I'm going to read a little bit more, OK? Because if I start talking, I will never finish. It'll be tomorrow. We will be in here. Your, your loved ones will be looking for you and texting you. What happened to you? You know. In many ways, the group Sweet Honey in the Rock continues the legacy of a specific historical moment where art, ideas, and activism could merge in specific forms. Early modern black feminism was filled by these kinds of artist activists, scholars activists, mothers teachers, African American women who used their social locations at the intersections of multiple systems of power to claim and not apologize for the vision provided by that space. By now, Tony Cade Bambara, Audre Lorde, Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, to name a few, are recognized figures of black feminism. Yet I wonder whether the way the academy has incorporated them, as well as their commitment to freedom and their expansive understandings of social justice, reinforces our current separation of art and activism, of scholarship and activism, and these patterns of incorporation inadvertently impoverish the power of the social justice vision that lies at the core of their work. Some academics blithely quote, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, without ever knowing that Audre Lorde said it, 
or the context in which she delivered this powerful message. Over time, the names and intentionality of Lord and similar artists, scholars, intellectual activists may fade, leaving an efficient university system that talks the talk of social justice, but that increasingly refuses to walk the walk, except here apparently. Okay, we're not talking about Grand Valley. All right, no. In this context, I want to stress that black feminist praxis was a central, central site that catalyzed intersectionality as an analytical framework on the world. It was very attached to black feminism. So to attempt to sever it and to say, oh, those days are gone, you know, we're something, we have a universal theory, this is, a, this is a red flag. The insights of black women involved in articulating black feminism is quite simple. They looked around and realized that neither race only, nor gender only, nor class only, nor sexuality only analyses of their oppression was likely to foster their freedom. These political responses to black women's subordination might yield relief, but they were unlikely to result in a lasting solution. In response to this insight, they claimed the right to speak for themselves and place themselves and their own interests in the center of analysis. Now, many people did and still do have a problem with this stance. Anytime you put black women in the middle or black men or any group that is a derogated group, the claim comes up, but isn't that particular? Is, is that universal enough? Maybe what you ought to do is do a comparative study of black women and white women. Yeah, that'll make it better. To put black women in the center and say we can actually theorize and argue from this location and see things that we cannot see from other spots remains radical and something that we continue to fight for. <sighs> blah, 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 blah. Okay. <laughs> Blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of blah, blah in here. But I've written a whole book on this. So I would encourage you to, you know, like I liked it when the, the pompous professors say, I would encourage you to read my book on this topic if you want to learn any more. <laughs> and I promised I'd never do that. But, you know, in this case, maybe that's what I should say. All right? Or we would be here all night. <laughs> in the next section of my talk, I'll talk more specifically about black feminism, about one facet of it. But here I really want to focus on this analytical frame of intersectionality and what it means and keep in mind that some of you are complete rookies to this. This is like inner what, inner who kind of thing. And others of you have been thinking about this for many, many years. So what I want to do is try and just do a quick summary of some of those main ideas of what intersectionality is. Because I want you to appreciate the scope of kind of what they came up with. Singing Ella's song. I just said that to you. Working definition of intersectionality. I have four points, just so you know. Here's the first point. Intersectionality is an emerging field of critical inquiry and practice that examines how complex social inequalities are organized, endure, and change. That's academic talk. Now, translation, all right? This is a field that basically says you're not going to understand violence. It's not going to understand violence. How it is organized, how it endures, and how it changes, how it feeds into social inequalities, unless you take an intersectional lens. And the kind of intersectional lens that you're going to need to take, I'm going to go forward and then I'm going to come back. The kind of intersectional lens that you need to take is that race, class, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, age, ability, religion, and nation constitute intercon interconnected systems of power that produce complex social inequalities. So let's think about something like the example of violence. Trayvon Martin is shot. It's not a simple case of Zimmerman misrecognized him and it's like two dudes you know, fighting it out. It wasn't a racial issue exclusively. It was very much about masculinity. If Trayvon Martin had been a woman, do you think he would have gotten shot as quickly? If Zimmerman had been a woman, had it been two women, if both of them had been gay, if one had been gay and one been straight, suppose they weren't in Florida, suppose they were in, quote, the hood, Maybe they're not in the hood. Maybe they're two blocks from the White House. When you start pulling in all the ways in which social structure shapes behavior and perception and translates into inequalities and perhaps social injustice, these are the kinds of things that intersectionality is designed to do. For something like violence, one could look at 
Gender violence, which can be very intimate in your house. People are, you know, let's say it is a, a male partner who is uh, abusing his girlfriend in quiet, in the domestic sphere, and people think that's violence, but that's one kind of violence. Or we may think about street violence where women walking down the street are harassed. A car pulls up and says $50, or depending on the kind of neighborhood you're in, who is harassed and how are they harassed? And we think that's a different kind of violence. Or we look at the kind of violence that occurs in warfare. The refugees that are currently pouring out of Syria into Turkey and into Lebanon. And we say that sure is violence. We recognize warfare as violence. That's natural violence on a structural scale. Or we look at infant mortality rates and we say if we go into really poor neighborhoods, you will find that the children die. They don't necessarily die because somebody shot them. They die because they're poor and because they lack access to services. We have learned to see violence as a social issue, as disconnected, as scattered, and as somehow buried within separate systems of inequality. There's racial violence, there's gender violence, there's hate speech and violence against gays and lesbians, the situation in Uganda. There's national violence. There are all different kinds of other violence on different levels of society. But in order to really understand the complexities of an issue like that, we have to take an intersectional framework that takes me back to number one. Intersectionality is an emerging field of critical inquiry and practice that examines how complex social inequalities, and I'm using the example of violence here, all right, as one outcome, are organized, endure, and change. Does that make sense to you? Just on some basic intuitive level. You don't have to get the academic talk. Well, if you get it, I'm thrilled. But I'm not giving you a test on this, so you're saved, a lot of you. I don't believe there is a test on the pink paper that you have. <laughs> All right, if there is, I might want to add a few questions of my own for you. All right. Second point, isn't this nice? I'm going so fast here. We've already gotten through the third point. We're back to two, and then we're going to skip the four. I want to stress this point, because this was one that is just very special and dear to me. Scholars and practitioners. Practitioners. Hold it. What did I just do? <gasps> did I skip to three and put this up? So you mean I, I did correct my slides? Wait a minute. Let me back up here. <laughs> That's what I wanted you to see when I was saying the last thing. Is that what you were looking at? OK, so then I want you to look at this. Yes. All right. So you haven't seen this yet. So my slides are actually in the correct order. Oh, this is amazing. <laughs> Scott. No, 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 no. I want to go back. I want to go back. Hold it. I want to go back. No, no, I don't. No, I don't. Hold it. Because I'm still, I'm still deciding what's the best way to put this. No, 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 no. What's that doing in there? Oh, gosh, these are messed up. All right. I can work with this. I can do this, all right? What I really wanted to say, although it's number five. Uh-oh. We are in trouble because we're looking at the wrong PowerPoint. All right, but we'll see. I can work with it. I did do it, so I know what's in it. <laughs> the point that I want to make here, and I think this is a very important point, intersectionality is not just an academic discourse. You will encounter this in colleges and universities. You will encounter it in coursework. You will encounter it as a scholarly debate. And there are many scholars who would be perfectly happy to argue about the in intricacies of intersectionality. But I want to put down here that activists, service providers, human resource staff, grassroots organizers, parents, teachers, kids, and ordinary people from many walks of life have also found intersectionality to be a useful tool in understanding and challenging the social inequalities that they see in their everyday lives. This is a tool that's taken, gotten legs under it. And I think it's because it's come from the situation of black women and black feminism. Now, scholars have a particular set of concerns that they are interested in studying. But this whole way of seeing the world as somehow having connections, I think, is the bigger idea that I want you to take away right here. So let me just read a little bit before I move on to part two. Because I have a few things I do want to say about this. And it talks to, this is sort of the bigger ideas about how these ideas of intersectionality speak to the world that we are in now. That's what I want to say before I move on. I don't want you to think we're living in the history, history exclusively. 
So this is the significance of the framework for us. We live in a desegregating world where the old boxes of power that kept people in their assigned places, as well as stories that we told each other to make those boxes comprehensible, no longer work. Many of you, I'm sure, are experiencing a desegregated world and did not realize how segregated your world was. Often when people get to a college campus, they look around and they say, I never knew that. I never met any people like that. And it can be extremely unsettling to them if they think they really knew those people. For example, you have a lot of white kids. If I might use the word white, is that okay? White people in here, can I use the word white? Yes, all right, we're okay now. A lot of white kids think they know black kids because black popular culture has been so prominent in their lives. So they say, yeah, I love Beyonce, Jay-Z, I understand, I'm with it, you know, that kind of thing. And lo and behold, they meet some actual black people at Grand Valley and who say, say what? All right? People at Grand Valley think, you know, people, you know, black kids at Grand Valley may say, you know, I really understand white people. I've watched television. I really get them. They're this way, they're that way, they're this way. And then they get here and they say, hold it. Now, what am I supposed to do? Some of them are just horrible, but some of them are really cool. All right? I've just never met people like this before. This is the whole notion of coming out of your boxes. Whether it's a racial box, a class box, a gender box, a sexual box, the box that used to say, well, I don't know about you, but I don't know any gay people. That's because they, the gay people were in the box, in the closet, and said, I'm over here, but I'm not telling you, all right? So now, all of this, I just never knew the world was this way. We are in a period of time when the old boxes of segregation of, all, of various kinds, and that's really what race and class and gender and all that stuff is all about. It's been organized to a logic of segregation. You see, so when black feminists look around and they say this logic of segregation, we cannot see our way to freedom in this particular logic. We've got to challenge the bigger thing of segregation. So we live in a desegregating world where the old boxes of power that kept people in their assigned places, as well as stories that we told each other to make those boxes comprehensible no longer work. This is a time of epic change when borders, boxes, walls, and barriers of all sorts, both intellectual and literal, have come down, with surprising new ones taking their place. Some pretty big walls have fallen in the lifetime of many of us in this room. For 28 years, from 1961 to 1989, the Berlin Wall was the literal and symbolic barrier of a divided Germany. The symbolic tearing down of that wall created space for new possibilities. You need to go see the place where that wall was. You need to learn that, that whole history of, of just people climbing up that wall and saying, we don't want a wall. We don't want to be segregated. We don't want to be walled off. We don't want to live the rest of our lives in a gated community, afraid. You see, that's what that was all about. The void, <clears throat> blah, 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 blah. Okay, fine. All right, I have other examples here, but I'm not going to worry about that. Are you all still there? Yes. Uh, yet, in response to these very changes, and there are lots of changes I could mention, the putting up of walls, the border between the U.S. and Mexico, big old barrier, let's, you know, we can't have, you know, the whole thing of trying to contain whatever's on the other side that is so threatening, all right? The gated communities, as I've mentioned, which are global and are attached to wealth. They aren't necessarily racialized. In some places they are, but they're attached to wealth and poverty. The whole private space is the space that's the good space that's within your border, and that's scary public space outside that might find its way in and do something horrible to you. This is the life that many people are living, a fearful life. All right, now, in response to these very same changes, the erosion of old certainties encourages many to try frantically to push the changes back into the boxes, conserving the imagined peace and quiet of tidy social relations where Negroes knew their place, uppity women were burned as witches, or political dissidents of all stripes were committed to insane asylums. But will reestablishing the status quo magically erase all those biracial babies approaching adulthood? Some sporting afros that rival those of Dante de Blasio. He's the son of the New York mayoral candidate, Bill de Blasio. If you saw him, Dante was in, he was in the campaign, at least in the East. 
Is censorship the answer to LBGT folk who are so brazen that they openly kiss and propose marriage to one another on cable TV's project runway? Oh, what's this world coming to? You know, if that's what you're seeing. Some see the erosion of the boxes of race, class, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, religion, age, and ability as a good thing, creating more space for individual freedom to say and do what you want. But many do not. And I would argue that violence that we see in the globe today is very much tied to ways of preserving these old ways of thinking. Violence is one especially visible and pernicious outcome of social changes that accompany these reorganized power relations. Is the world more violent today? I don't know, it seems so. But that may be because we have a better view of it. Now, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on. We can come back to this and say more about it, but as I think we should, are you okay? Would everybody mind if, anybody mind if I took a sip of water? They've given me two bottles of water up here. And I think I might actually need them. All right, so now I have to get the clicker. I have to move on to part two. Ta-da. All right, we're on schedule. Black feminism and the meaning of freedom. In the, vi in the video they sang, although you might not have heard it, Struggling for myself don't mean a whole lot. I come to realize that teaching others to stand up and fight is the only way my struggles survive. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. So, who was the Ella of Ella's song? I'm thinking many of you probably don't know. This is a good way to get at this whole thing of the meaning of freedom. And why should we consider singing her song? I'm not an expert on Ella Baker, but I can point you to an individual who is. We've got a book cover here. Oh, wait a minute. Hold it. What did I do with the clicker? Oh, there. Watch this. Is that cool or what? <laughs> Hold it. Let me get this. Ella Baker. Barbara Ransby. I love this place. You have great technology here. All right. <laughs> but Barbara Ransby has written a path-breaking book on Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, a radical democratic uh, vision. How many of you have ever heard of Ella Baker? That's good. All right. Because she's one of these people where she has been so central, but there are a lot of people like her who've done major work, but we don't know much about them because the scholarship doesn't retrieve their lives the way it might or they didn't write a lot themselves because they were so busy doing things. So all I can do here is to introduce you to this particular black feminist um, activist and build from her. And I think I just, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip. I have a clip that I would be happy to play for you later on, but I'm gonna skip that and just keep going. What I really think is important for me to say here is this, black feminism, as a social justice project has been deeply embedded within the broader freedom struggle of African-American communities. Now, if you think I'm exaggerating or using the term freedom struggle loose me, loosely, let me say a bit more about what I mean. Freedom struggle within African-American communities has a palpable meaning. And within that broader understanding of freedom struggle, education broadly defined has been a core site of political activism. Now, it's really interesting, because today, a lot of us have the notion that education is something you get to get away from the real world. You know, terms like ivory tower, or I'll get some skills in education, I'll hide out, as opposed to seeing education as a site where so much activism has occurred, and certainly activism by black women. The meaning of freedom. I am not happy with my, with my PowerPoint. This was not supposed to be there. There we go. This is where I want to be here. African Americans, critical education, and black freedom struggle. What I want to argue here is that freedom struggle has been central for black women and for African Americans. Now, how many of you saw 12 Years a Slave? Any of you see that? That is one of the, it's the only movie I think I've seen where I've been able to go to a, a movie on slavery which, that I think actually got at the sense of the aspirations of enslaved people. What freedom would have meant for the slaves that you saw, for the enslaved people you saw in that particular film. Under slavery, literacy was forbidden. Northrop was able to free himself because he had literacy. He was able to smuggle a note out 
to say, come and help me. So the power of education, and education as being central to freedom, is the way freedom has been organized within African American communities. So under slavery, you have reading and literacy. After slavery, emancipation, you see a tradition of founding schools and of public education. During the Civil Rights Movement, the Brown versus Board of Education, which took down the whole edifice of segregation, was about education. There were many other things that were segregated, but education was seen as the site of struggle for the future. In the 1960s, the racial desegregation of higher education became ground zero for black students and their freedom struggle. Because when they entered higher education, it wasn't just as tokens. It was an opportunity. They came as ambassadors from their communities. And institutions changed as a result. And in the 2000s, we face a very different kind of, or maybe a continuation of these earlier struggles. Are you keeping up with the uh, situation at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor? I believe they've got a, is it a Twitter thing going on? What is that that they've got going on? Yeah, the panel, the the Hashtag B, BBUM, BBUM, being black at UM. All right, and the whole notion of why that would emerge now and use that particular format, people not realizing these are not just strange black students there. These are fewer than before. As exclusion sets in again, you get, you get behaviors changing. So we're in a very interesting period of time of access is being limited, incorporation of who, and co-optation. So yeah, it's no longer a simple thing of let the black kids in and then they will just help, as, as many black mothers would have thought before. Now it's more a situation of what kind of students do we have? How are we grooming them? How might some of them walking around talking stuff about intersectionality that is not connected to social justice find better prospects for employment? Perhaps an Exxon, I don't know, or somebody like that, all right. So the whole notion of thinking about freedom struggle and working with the young and education has been quite central. Now this is where Ella Baker's work becomes really important. Because Ella Baker was in this, um, this period of time. Where is my little, my little light? Come on, come on. Oh, never mind. It's the one in the middle. All right? <laughs> the Civil Rights Movement. She was central to the Civil Rights Movement. Working with young people. She was central to SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And she said things like this. Strong people don't need leaders. She says, my basic sense of it has always been to get people to understand that in the long run, they, they, in the long run, they themselves are the only protection that they have against violence or injustice. People have to be made to understand that they cannot look for salvation anywhere but to themselves. So for Ella Baker, the idea of leading people to freedom was a contradiction in terms. Freedom occurs when you can lead yourself to freedom. Freedom occurs when you have the critical insight to figure out what needs to happen next and to try. So this link between freedom struggle, between black feminism and intersectionality are really very linked. Because without that vision of freedom, without something bigger that you're a part of, why would you keep going? It's just a day-to-day -day grind to get up every day and just keep going. Let me move on to part three. We're not gonna be able to do all of that, I'm sorry. I have been a bad presenter, and I have to move on to part three so that we can, in fact, engage the entire argument. So, so far, I've taken you through black feminism as a knowledge project and talked a little bit about, about intersectionality and its implications, what it is and how it works today. I've moved into the second part, which talks about um, we who believe in freedom, the significance of believing in something, not just, you know, sort of, I don't know, just I, I agree with it, but you believe in it. You give yourself over to it, body and soul, because it's going to be part of who you are. You cannot let it go. And I've introduced to you the whole notion of African-American freedom struggle as one example of we who believe in freedom. All right, so the first part was the we. Who's the we? Intersectionality is a more expansive notion of we. The second part, uh, who believe in freedom. Now I move on to cannot rest until it comes. So black feminism here, the ethics and dignity of struggle. 
Now, I open this talk by pointing to the facts of the Trayvon Martin case. Here I want to identify another fa facet of the Trayvon Martin case that points to a third lesson in black feminism. The Trayvon Martin case raises the question of what to do when one knows about oppression, when one sees the injustices, and in this case, experiences failure. No matter how impassioned the social media organizers, no matter how long they persisted, at some point they simply lost. What does it mean to say, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes? Is that just a song? Now, I'm a sociologist. My job is to study the patterns that underlie social structures, to learn how to analyze and think about the social injustices that are woven into the fabric of our everyday lives. I've brought to you ideas about intersectionality and ideas about black feminism and ideas about freedom. But is knowing enough? Some days I want to rest. Some days it feels too big, too much. How can any one person think this much? You know more and you see more and you feel you can actually do less. That is a dangerous place to be. So once you know about social injustices, what do you do? Once you know that social change requires repeated episodes of failure, how do you keep going? Some days, the more you know, the more impossible it can all seem. Once you understand the magnitude of the problem, helped out by intersectionality and freedom, how do you keep going? When you are tired, when do you get to rest? There's a real fork in the road between the pessimist who says, I'm going to put my head down. This is all too big for me. I don't want to know. I'm simply going to have to run away someplace and leave it behind. But these black women could not let it go. What if you go out of your way to ignore injustice? But you don't want to know, but it lands on your doorstep day after day after day. And that's fundamentally the situation that many, many black women have been in. And not just black women, obviously, but many people are in. I, know, I see so much now that I don't really want to know. The challenge is to resist becoming numb to this dehumanization, to not dehumanize yourself in the face of the suffering, especially if the targets of such assault are you or your loved ones. But what do you do? But once you know, then what? Now, what stood out for me, I'm actually pretty hopeful here, by the way. All right, you need to know this. I'm moving up to a hopeful crescendo at the end. All right, just so you know. I don't want you going home crying and all that. What stood out for me in this event was that many of Martin's followers saw themselves in Trayvon Martin. They saw his humanity. They saw injustice through his humanity. They did not stereotype him as just another black kid who was in the wrong place. He probably did something. He was a thug. And not only did they see it, they seemed willing to try and do something about the social injustice that he faced. There was a fledgling we there among people who before couldn't find one another, but who had a catalyst. So when those hoodies went on, that was a catalyst. Might not have been a lasting catalyst, but it was something different. Perhaps many people who were doing that saw the possibilities for a politics that was bigger than their own individual self-interest. You know that's what our politics are like in this country. You only do things just for you, self-interest. Altruism, doing things for other people, stupid, loser, just put an L on your head. You're giving your money away, what's wrong with you? That kind of thing. We live in a country that really encourages us to be individualistic and mean-spirited beyond um, who we are. I think we're better than that. So when I look at this, I began to see another politics emerge. Another politics that emerges from another generation. And this is the generation that Ella Baker helped nurture. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. There's a line in there where she says, handing it over to the young. That's what needs to happen. Now, you know, let me say, even that wasn't enough to get me going. All right, I'm just thinking, oh, well, I got to go give this talk, and Trayvon Martin is so depressing, boo-hoo, boo-hoo, boo-hoo. But what was interesting for me was why I picked this particular song. I have a nephew, young African-American man going to a, he just graduated from a school, small liberal arts college. Can I say it? Can I say the word white again? Okay. Very white. Okay. In a fraternity. A white one. All right. And there he is, you know, just sort of doing his thing. You know, he's, he's living the post-racial dream, I thought. Whatever, all right? 
<laughs> and after Trayvon Martin was, um, after the verdict, the next day, I have a little Facebook account. I have 21 friends. Now, I know some of you have like 5,000 friends, all right? I don't need 5,000 friends. I don't even need the 21 I have, <laughs> okay? I might drop a few of those people. But I go on my Facebook to, to relax. I don't go in there to keep up with the latest trends and this, that, and the other. But my nephew had posted the link to this particular video. He posted the link to We Who Believe in Freedom Cannot Rest Until It Comes, Ella's song, Sweet Honey in the Rock. And I thought, how'd that happen? That doesn't make any sense to me. So clicked on it, and I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, ah, I hadn't thought about this in a while. But what intrigued me was the fact that he was the one who posted it, you see. So I think something is going on that I really want people to help me think about. It is another kind of politics that's attached to youth. It's a politics that embraces, it's a generational politics, that embraces ideas like freedom and recasts them in the language of social justice. It embraces ideas of intersectionality, and this is why I stress the scholarship and practice, because it doesn't necessarily separate scholarship from practice. And it's a politics that may bubble up in the most unlikely places. One of the students that I'm working with at the University of Maryland is doing a dissertation on spoken word poetry. And she has spent the last two and a half years um, following around and visiting and participating with young spoken word poets in the Washington, D.C. area. When I say young, they're high school kids. All right, that's how young they are. And the things that they are talking about openly through their poetry, through speaking them aloud and constructing a community of folk from so many different backgrounds, the things that they talk about honestly and openly is another form of politics. So she's writing a dissertation where she's trying to think through the implications of us looking for politics in one place to such a degree that we don't see it in another place. Where there, it's a politics, sadly, of hope. That's a phrase that has been hijacked. You know, you have a good word and then they steal it and they use it to sell you chicken, all right? Like, you know, my first, when I saw my first rap, Kentucky Fried Chicken rap commercial, I said, that's the end of that. All right, that genre's done, all right? <laughs> so we have to be careful when it's the politics of hope and then it becomes a slogan for an election campaign, all right? But maybe this is a time when we really have to hang on to that particular word because this is probably why we believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Because we remain hopeful. And the reason we remain hopeful is that we can imagine things that are different than the way we are now. We know it doesn't have to be this way. And we also take responsibility for trying to do something different. Like when those poets take the risk to get up in front of people and say the things that they say, man, those are some responsible people. They're not off in the corner whining about what somebody didn't do for them, or why can't I have another multicultural person in my staff, and blah, 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 all this, that, and you're not saying that's happening here. I know it's not happening here. However, they're not doing that. Maybe when we start talking about we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes, we build on that expansive notion of we. We build on that notion of committing to something bigger than ourselves. And we build on that notion of cannot rest until it comes because we see the ethics and the dignity of struggle. We see struggle as something that has meaning, even if you don't win. Because when you do it for a bigger cause, how can you go wrong? So, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. I leave you with that one sentence. I would encourage you to go to the website of the Ella Baker Center, where there's a lot of information on her, and you can see this video, and you can do all those kinds of things. And I have nothing to do with that center. I didn't set it up. I don't get any money for it or anything like that. But I want to stop there. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm taking a, um, an Afri African American class here on campus, and AAA um, 340. And basically, we're talking about post-blackness and black solidarity. 
And um, I'm not I'm not sure the, the term about post-blackness is not something that people talk about a lot, but when you talk about we um, and talking about intersectionality, um, uh, the argument of like black solidarity, how much of it do we need and how much of, of it that we do not need um, is something that I'm interested on. Okay. You talking about. Yeah? Okay. People tend to think that you have to have one thing or the other that you have a racial solidarity or you have an interracial solidarity, in, you know, interracial solidarity, as opposed to recognizing that the process of building solidarity occurs within every single group that you are in. So among black people, there are efforts to build solidarity. There's huge heterogeneity among black people. So the whole question of post-racial, um, I would be perfectly happy to be post-racial if the country would quit shooting black kids, to be honest with you. All right, so what I'm trying to say is post-raciality is one of those um, dreams that I suppose if you can convince enough people that they're post-black, they can say that's the world I want to live in and I'm already living in. So as an aspirational concept, to be judged by the content of your character, not by the color of your skin, all of that, is uh, very, very worthy. That's definitely a worthy goal. But to conflate the, the, the goal with the reality of we're already here can take away the language that you need to get there. So getting to a post-racial society or a post-black society, whatever that might be, means you gotta go through race to get there. You gotta deal with the ugly stuff of the injustices that are built into the system itself that may be in the rules themselves in terms of something like the mortgage crisis would be a really good example. We're so busy worrying about our identities that we're not looking at the structural things that are happening around us. African Americans have lost the vast bulk of their wealth from 2008 on because of the mortgage crisis. Because black wealth, which it took a whole generation of people to accumulate to buy houses, lost equity in those homes. And many of the loans that they were in, this is black and Latinos and poor people, by the way, but you really see it in terms of how it operates in certain black neighborhoods, lost their wealth, lost their money. Now that is a, how is that post-racial, you see? If you see racial disparities like that, who benefits if we take an argument that it's post-black? It's not post-black, but it's not exclusively black. And this is why intersectionality is really important. Because until you can see the patterns in your own community, among your own group, and see what your own interests are, it's very difficult to engage in coalition with others, you see. So the coalition with Latinos, with whites, with poor whites, with, I mean, a lot of different groups who are, who are coming from very different locations and saying, I see myself in that situation. I see my issue in that situation. That's where I was going with the whole notion of Trayvon Martin. And you have people who were really bothered by that, who did not look like Trayvon Martin, who've never been to Florida, who might be even named Zimmerman, and they're wearing hoodies, all right? Those kinds of things. So we live in times when we're really trying to figure out what a social justice agenda would look like. And rushing too quickly to um, collapsing, assuming we're living in the future, is not a good solution, and also, why would I want to abandon post-blackness? I like black. Why do I want to be post-black? You see? Black's cool with me. So the whole notion of what does that mean? It's just, is that a political category? What is that? All right? So I just think these are really interesting times around those types of issues, you see, and, and not jumping up too quickly to take up the rhetoric of the dominant group and just say, because we're in college, we're going to make it our own. I'm just feeling really forthright tonight, so let me know if I'm scaring you at all, because if I am, maybe that's a good thing, but I'm just tired of prettying things up, to be honest with you. So much of what we do in academia is just pretty. Pretty, pretty, pretty. Nobody wants, you know, so, <laughs> yes. Now you're gonna have to really yell, because you're not at the mic, all right, so just yell it out. I think race is a shifting category. My definition of race is that race has always been a socially constructed political category. Not just socially constructed, political. It performs certain functions in terms of groups. 
It forms groups in certain points in, in historical time that benefit certain races and that um, uh, put others down. It's a really convenient language that attaches itself to many other systems of power. We understand race through the language of family, for example. All right? We understand race and ethnicity through the language of family. We understand family through the language of race and nation through the language of race. Race is very residual as a political language and it attaches itself to specific social groups, not forever. Black people 100 years ago are different than black people today. Not in terms of the actual you know, soul of the person, but who counts as black and who doesn't. And the whole fiction that this is all self-defined. Like I'm gonna get up tomorrow and say, I've decided I'm tired of being black. I want to be racially ambiguous. That's who I am today, you know, that kind of thing. Really is, is just putting blinders over the fact that this is about power. This isn't about identity. Identity and identifications come from power. So if we want different ideas about race, those are contested constructs. I would really like to see a political notion, for example, of something like people of color. People of color can just mean pigmentation. That would be a descriptive view of race that says, all, I can go out with a camera and I find all, I have, you know, I have, like, used to be the old paper bag test, but I find, you know, I go out with like a litmus test of paper and I say, all you dark people over there, now you're officially the black people, and you people over here, you're the white people, and all the little brown people are going, I don't know where to go, that's my crisis, I have an existentialist crisis, you know, I mean, we get all distracted by stuff like that, as opposed to really looking at race as a political category, the um, work that it does under certain social contexts, like now. What's the work that it's doing by not being talked about? Yeah, interesting. So I don't know if that's a firm definition, but that would be definitely a mini teachable moment about race, that's how I would describe it, and racism. Okay, hi. Um, thanks for coming, by the way. Um, as someone who I identify as, as a feminist, and um, I, I realize, though, that mainstream fem feminism has been really alienating to black women because it doesn't include intersectionality, and, um, and I see that also, like, how uh, people just accept heteronormity and everything like that. And so I was wondering what you do in the face of people who refuse to accept that even though the manifestations are different, that hate is still hate and it's still a problem. Well, that's one solution. Um, but I think another solution is to point out that black women have not been uniformly negative about feminism. They've been negative about certain dimensions of feminism. A feminism that has an intersectional frame and is really inclusive, I don't see any negativity there. And in fact, if you go back, you will find that black women have been feminists for quite some time. Look at the um, situation, when was this? Historians can help me out here, but I'm thinking about the example of Ida Wells Barnett, who crashed the parade in Washington, D.C. that was for women's rights for voting. And the white women of the South said, we can't have you with us because um, you know, that's gonna make it bad for women. They wanted a, a gender only uh, argument that meant gender meant white women. And Ida Wells Barnett said, oh no, 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 we're not going there with you on that one. This is really something different. I can find you lots of examples of black women. Pauli Murray is one of the founders of the National Organization for Women, right, for now. And she is the one who, not only did she talk about race and class issues, but she also, to, under today's conditions, might even be, if she'd had the opportunity, she might be transgendered. All right, so you really read her work and you realize that there have been women all along who might not claim the term black feminism or feminism itself because of its association with a certain brand of white women, which is not even the issue. It's the media depiction of the fear of women. All right, sort of the, what's been done to that term. So I think we have to really reclaim this whole history Rather than saying, can't you just, see, you know, I can, I, wanna know, I can see how you want to rush to solidarity under the banner of a universal hate is hate. But that's not going to paper over all the stuff that has to be uncovered and dealt with in terms of the historical specificity. I just don't think we've heard each other enough around this. And it's, a, it's another indication of the segregation. And asking the question, when you have segregated knowledges like this, 
You have a knowledge where we know all about person X's history, but we know nothing about person Y's history to the point where we assume person Y has no history. We're all miseducated by that, right? So I know that might not be the answer you're looking for, but I think, uh, I think it's a really, the, it's a much harder answer, all right, than what can I say to black women to convince them to be feminists? All right, yeah, that's not what you said, but that's often how people will ask that question. All right, and, um, and you know, the reverse is, what can you say to white women to, to, so they can do a better job? I mean, it's sort of like the assumption is the multicultural women's movement at the end is really the, the, the you know, the, uh, the gold ring. And I'm saying it's the struggle that's the issue. The dignity and the struggle of building a movement is really how you get where you want to go. All right. Okay, I'm not sure about that, but I may say more about that in a minute, but that's what I'm saying for now, all right? <laughs> That I don't know. You know, I don't necessarily think that intersectionality covers everything, all right? But I do know that certain forms of violence, I think, that are mass shootings, they take that form, are associated with these issues. Um, the case in, um, gosh, Norway, I believe it was Norway, the young man who went and armed himself, it wasn't a school shooting, but he armed himself and, and sort of planned a massacre of youth, and he hunted them on an island. What is not talked about is that those youth were young, progressive youth. A lot of them were multicultural. They were youth of color. They really spoke to the whole notion of uh, Norway. I believe it was Norway. Um, no longer being Norwegian the way historically it had been. So there may be subtexts to some of these incidents that, are, um, that, that speak to questions of, of inequality or speak to Perhaps the shooter, see, I, I happen to think anybody that does things like this is just kind of in another psychological category. So this is where I would really start for myself personally. But I just don't think we know enough about pattern shootings because we treat each one of them as discrete events. That's how we're encouraged to look at them in this particular country, not as a pattern of gun violence or a pattern of shootings, or, but as, oh well, crazy person X went out and shot up the school. Um, so I don't know if I know enough to answer that question, but I think that's really an interesting, I think that's a good question to ask. You look. Yes. But then there's a guy at um, Virginia Tech who was not. He was Korean. He was a young man though. You know, so the whole question of mental health and mental illness and what helps people be healthy and ill and you could go down the road of access to services, you could go down a lot of roads there in terms of structural stuff. It becomes really complicated. And who is really responsible when someone does something like that? The people who stood by and didn't do anything. So that there are a whole lot of ways of slicing into that particular issue. Yep, go ahead, go ahead. Speak right into it. Do I just, oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, um, again, thank you for appearing today. Um, I'm currently in a women's and gender studies course on campus, which I absolutely love. And is here? I don't know, is Ayana Weekly here? Yeah, right there. Okay. That was five extra credit points. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> I'll see you in class tomorrow. <laughs> um, and we examine different inequalities, not just gender, but also racial, social, and sexual inequalities in our society and around the world. And we also read from personal experiences and essays from amazing authors. And the entire time I was sitting there, I was wondering if there was a, an experience, if there was an event that has personally affected you and just made you into the woman that you are today and has made you this, hmm. just um, you. <laughs> well, I don't know about all, all, that sounds kind of heroic, but I mean, trying to, because there've been, there've been so many things when you're outraged. They usually tend to be experiences when I'm either outraged or very, very sad. You know, I mean, the experiences that, that really stay with you are the ones where you say never again or you say, that was wrong, and right now I'm little and weak and I can't do anything about it, but someday I will. I mean, I believe in the power of memory. So I would have to go back to earlier incidents 
and um, wonder things. And a lot of them have to do with my mother, who I haven't really talked about or written about. Because I don't, you know, I, I, in this culture, this confessional culture, this is what people want you to do. They want, it's something called the money shot. All right, you watch talk, you watch television, and they zoom in and they say, how did that make you feel? And you're supposed to go, <laughs> and they just shoot the tears. I mean, that's the money shot, all right, in terms of getting guests who will do that. So that's the nature of the culture that we're in, and I think to a certain degree, that whole um, using personal experience that way is, is kind of um, a spectacle, use it as a, spe as a spectacle, as entertainment. So I've shied away from that. But at the same time, I really realize the power of things that are attached to certain things I care about. For example, I think the major issue is growing up in Philadelphia and trying to really come to terms with the difference between what my parents were told and taught and tried to teach me about America and the reality of what they had to go through, which was completely different than what we were taught. My father was a proud veteran of World War II, and yet he could not get a loan to buy a house in the suburbs. So every time I teach material about the suburbs, I think about that. My mother wanted to be an English teacher. She was really brilliant. She was really smart. She was, mu she was musically inclined. She was, she was so smart, she walked across town to go to a different high school where people didn't even want her. Intellect. But my mother could find no outlet for her creativity. So she had mental illness. And I wanted to know who was crazy. Was she crazy? Or was a society crazy that treated her the way they treated her? Those are the kinds of things I thought about when I was 15, 16, 17. You know, I was kind of weird. What can I say? And I read a lot. All right, you know. <laughs> but in terms of just the, the kinds of events, a lot of it for me is something called um, Mills's, C. Wright Mills's sociological imagination. If you've ever heard of that particular phrase. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> She did not pay me to say that. Seriously, I really, I believe this. Because it's considered the intersection of biography, of history, and social structure. And I think one of the reasons I became a sociologist was I like the whole idea of being able to keep a person in their biography. And I also realized tonight's talk, the historical trajectory of being part of something bigger, but also looking around at the social structure that you are in. So a lot of it came from my, from my youth, things that I wish my parents hadn't had to experience. I've actually had a pretty peaceful and you know, good life, but that doesn't mean that I don't look around me and see horrible things around me and have to always be confronted by what does it mean the first time I have to step over a homeless person in the streets of New York? Because when the, when the social safety net of the country began to shrink, I'd never seen that. And lo and behold, after, excuse me, in the 80s, when you know, a certain political party came in and started cutting back on housing, uh, I saw people sleeping in the streets. I'd never seen that in America. We, sent, we had a social welfare state, I thought. And what does that say to me to dehumanize myself to not see that suffering? So th th you know, we're always confronted by all these kinds of things if we open ourselves up to look. The issue is how to analyze them and how to connect them to something bigger than ourselves. And that's the history and that's the social structure. So I know there wasn't a like, pristine story about when I was this and when I was four. I could tell you the Queen Pat story, I like that one. The day all the boys didn't come to daycare. Excuse me, all the girls didn't come to daycare. Big snowstorm, all right? And that's when I realized gender early. I went to daycare. But you know, the uh, girls didn't come because they didn't come. The boys came, it was like seven boys and me. And I took over the playhouse and I ordered them around all day long. It was wonderful. You, come over here. It was such an, it was like such a power rush when I look back on it. You know what I mean? And that's, you know, kinds of, you know, those kinds of things in terms of coming to terms with what gender really means. Those experiences that you have and you say, well, what was that? Why am I remembering that one? So I have fun ones, but I also have some very sad ones too. All right. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Why am I doing this? I'm surprised oh. somebody's over here. Okay. How are you? Hello. I just want to say that it's an honor being here in your presence. I've, excuse me, um, done a lot of extensive research on your works in, in terms um, in looking at a lot of the um, controlling imagery and black sexual politics research that you've done regarding media images. So in looking at contemporary programming on TV, especially in prime time right now, as it considers black women, I don't know if you're familiar with being Mary Jane or Scandal and the characters on those shows. Before I continue. 
Okay, okay, okay. So now that we have you, I guess, on record being a gladiator, um, <laughs> I just wanted to... Well, I'm proud um, to be familiar with Scandal. I All just right. wanted to get your perspective in terms of the archetypes that you wrote about regarding um, the controlling images of black women on TV and in film and in you know, music, in terms of videos. Um, so in terms of like you know, characters such as being Mary Jane and um, Carrie Washington on Scandal being portrayed in this kind of Jezebel role, yet being very um, distinguished and smart and successful. Like, I wonder, like, how you, what your thoughts are, you know, in terms of that, because they have those dual roles. But you've already given, given me, a, I think, the beginning of a really interesting analysis. And that's exactly how I would use what I've written, because the thing about pop culture is the content always changes. So you've got to go for what are the, the repeating tropes. And one of them is going to be the Jezebel, another's going to be the Mammy, another is going to be the respectable black lady, another's going to be the Hoochie Ho Mama, another, the fifth one's going to be the welfare mom. You know, the mother. I mean, they're just several things that fitting people into those boxes to make them understandable. But the trappings of the boxes may shift depending on the needs of the culture. So we can't have, uh, you know, well, we certainly have enough Jezebel's prostitutes still running around these shows, for my taste. You know, I mean, I just, there's another one, okay, so we're still doing that. But I don't think people realize the implications of the Kerry Washington character on uh, Scandal in terms of the Sally Hammond story, all right, in terms of her being the mistress of the president and what you got from that. So the whole notion of rewriting, coming to terms with the history of the kinds of relationships that people had, there's this a text, there's a subtext, and there's a deep subtext to me on that particular show. Now, I don't know if she's going for all of this, but this is why I watch the show, aside from the fact they all look really cool and I like her clothes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I can, I can be distracted by things like that. I think the issue now is to really think about are there new archetypes that are emerging? Because these are all about power. These are about power relations. They're not necessarily just about depiction. Is it accurate or not? It's not accuracy. It's really how these ideas work to, and who are they designed for? And what are they designed to tell people? So for example, we may be in an era where sexuality has really been, we've crossed over to another point, where sexuality is really a free space. And you ought to be able to do whatever you want to do, wherever, when, you know, really, we shouldn't be regulating sexuality the way it's happened to before. So maybe the whole notion of the sexual freedom of black women to be sexually free without that being perceived as them being prostitutes or hoes, maybe that's a space of freedom. I mean, I don't know. Those are the kinds of questions that I think the work that I would be interested in reading, those are the types of questions that they would engage. So I'm not particularly interested in being right or wrong about anything, because I don't think there's right or wrong there. I think it's a question of laying out some conceptual tools and a starting place and then seeing where are we in 2014? Where are we in uh, 2024? I'm trying to do 10 years at a time. Because I can't, you know, when I retire, I'm going to be happy as a clam watching all the stuff that you're watching. But right now, I just cannot afford to keep up with pop culture. So you're going to have to write it. Okay. So somebody who is thinking about these things and looking to explore some of those topics, like what advice would you give in terms of a starting point? I would start with what you know. I would start with what you think. Always start with your own honest voice and trust your gut. Really, you know, just look at it and say, something's not right there. I can't figure it out yet, but I will. Or I'm not sure about that. There's something good, you know, something like when I had to think about Bootylicious. I don't know how I felt about Bootylicious. You know, on one hand, there's this whole history of booty, you know, booties and black women's booties and what that meant and blah, da 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 and that was accurate. But then there was this whole thing of Beyonce is not one bit bothered by booty, all right? And she's getting paid to be Bootylicious. So, I mean, I had to really think about what is, hmm, things are rarely all good or all bad. They're all sort of, what's the space of agency for black women? How are black women using these particular images, perhaps as a counter image, a counter control, in ways that we are not recognizing. Yeah, you think you can control me with that image of booty? I'm gonna take it back. You're gonna pay me to take it back. That's a very interesting way to think about the world. So I don't know. This is a different set of um, economic and class relations that we're in now. We're in a different phase of capitalism. It runs differently than it did before in some ways. Uh, so what I, the advice I would give is, Trust your gut. Sketch out the argument, and you may find that the things that support your argument that are in places you didn't even think to look. Thank you. Okay? 
Are you going to go do this now, right? Okay, you sure? Okay, go do it now. Don't make me say all that, then you don't do anything. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Hello, Patricia Hill Collins. How are you doing today? Okay, all right. Well, uh, I just want to let you know, for one, I admire your intellect. You are one smart individual. And just in case if you didn't know, you look really good today. I just thought I'd let you know that. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Look at her. Look at her. <laughs> and I didn't even pay him to say that. This would be in the category, brother got some moves. Is that what it is? <laughs> okay, well, okay, thank okay. you very much. Let it's me all come back. good. But, um, no, but also, I want to say something. Thank you for the praise, but smart is one thing. Prepared is something else. You have to work extremely hard to prepare, to study. And when you read something and you don't understand it, you have to read it again and, and read it again until you get it. So I'm a person who spent a lot of time preparing. All right? So you can start off with talent. I consider myself to be talented. But at the same time, there's a lot of work that goes into this. And I wouldn't want to say that to everybody in this room, particularly those of you who are students. All right, I'm encouraging you to just, just push a little harder than you're used to pushing, perhaps. Now, having said that, I'm giving you a hard time before you oh, even no, ask your you question. You ain't giving me a hard time. <laughs> you just proved my point, pretty much. But, well, to get to my question, overall, it is hard being a man and identifying as a feminist. I'm not going to lie. When I, when I tell people I'm a feminist, sometimes I get this turned up look and people be looking at me like, you're a feminist? And people think that I'm demasculinizing myself and... That is the answer. I don't care if you stand alone. You will find people who support you. You see? Yes. And you have to Thank find. <laughs> All right. It is hard. And there, the issue is that you can go places and do work that I can't go. Because if you are a male and you're a feminist, you, ha you, ha you don't have to do this. But you have the opportunity to talk to men, and speci specifically to talk to black men, in ways that I can't talk to them. And there are black men out there doing that work. I couldn't write black sexual politics until there were black men who actually were doing work on black masculinity that was analytical. I had to wait for them. You know, I had to find the black male feminists, if you want, or the, the black men who were taking the ideas of feminism and saying, this is bigger than just feminism. This is bigger than black feminism. So I'm happy to hear this question, but the point is, this, you know, I know you get a hard time. So I figure you could probably stand a little love, all right, so you can go a little further. Thank you. That's my answer. <laughs> And I have never done that before. So you are the first. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, hi, thanks for coming. I just wanted to know your thoughts on um, a topic that I'm very passionate about. And going back to what you said, we, we who believe in freedom and about how African-American women fought for the education of African-American children and other children of different races. How do you feel about how African-American youth today aren't taking advantage of the education that's offered to them? Depends on the day, to be honest with you. Some days, um, it depends on what I look at. It kind of cuts in so many different directions. I think that m many black youth in colleges the cost of their education has been to sever their connections to black people. All right, this whole question of post-blackness really speaks to that. Um, and I think that is unfortunate. That there, you know, that, uh, and if you want to, that's fine. But I'm saying if that's the cost you have to pay, that's unfortunate. So when I hear black students who just don't know the history and what it took to get them there, in terms of their responsibilities, um, that they're a beachhead, that not everybody gets to go, you got to go, what are you gonna do with it, that kind of thing. Um, that's hard for me sometimes. But I also realize that if our job is to teach, it isn't to blame. 
It's to say, well, if you don't know, I'm going to talk to you some more about this. All right. I don't necessarily think that's the same situation in high schools. So when you say youth, I would look at youth in college and I would look at youth in high schools. The high schools for African American youth are still much more segregated. You look at the, you know, the stats on schooling, you realize that most black kids are going to segregated schools. So they're not dealing with these issues that, that seem to be, we, we project onto all black youth. The black youth that we're really talking about often with this post-raciality are college students, they're middle class youth, they're youth who've grown up in white communities perhaps. You know, they're, they're sort of dealing with issues of identity. If you drop back to that prior youth who are in high school and middle school, they're, they're, they're actually seeing the world differently. They're talking about, it's a lovely book called Our Schools Suck, all right? I mean, the <laughs> kids got together and wrote. <laughs> you know, there's, I think there's a whole frame of analysis in black and Latino youth, not just black youth, but black and Latino youth who, are, who understand what they're looking at in terms of mass incarceration, who understand what they're looking at in terms of the quality of their schooling, the quality of policing, there aren't jobs, this, that, and the other. Because they don't see college as a way to fix any of that stuff. They know there's not enough for all of them to go. And we don't necessarily look to that group as a political group we continue to try and get them to fit in and sort of fix them up so they can go to college, which is okay too. So I don't know. I think we just need to do a better job of thinking about, of studying actual black youth, as opposed to speculating based on anecdotal information of the five people we know or the students in our classes that we see in, you know, wherever we may be. I just don't know the an I don't know that, I want more answers to those kinds of questions. Mm, sorry. Hello. Um, I am actually in an African American studies class, and we were discussing black feminism versus white feminism. And I wanted your opinion on the contrast and how black identity kind of influences black feminism. To be honest with you, hmm, I hear this the right way now. <laughs> I think that's not the question we should be asking, all right? How, so I'm not going to answer your question. I'm going to ask, hmm, what question should we be asking? Perhaps we want to ask, what are the points of overlap, convergence, and divergence of black and white feminism, or the feminisms that have been expressed by black and white women, right? Rather than thinking about this thing as a feminist thing, it's a bunch of ideas, or excuse me, a, a knowledge thing that's finished. There's this thing called white feminism, and this thing called black feminism. We think about both of these we think about all feminisms as emerging from the lived experiences of the women who craft those ideas and the men who also participate in crafting them and supporting them. And we begin to look where are the points of convergence and divergence among black and white women as they're actually living their lives. What are the common issues that they both raise, albeit differently? I think one is the question of violence. I've certainly mentioned that. But it's going to take a different contour. It's going to take different um, forms depending on whether, let's say, a, a middle-class straight white woman who's married raises the issue of sexual violence in her home, and a uh, black woman who's middle-class raises issues of sexual violence in her home and can't raise it the same way because she has certain images she has to uphold because she's respectable, that kind of thing. Um, we have to begin to look at more conversation and dialogue to even know what each of those things is, black feminism and white feminism. Now, if you're asking the question, what does racial identity have to do with black feminism? Why would we not also be asking the question, what does racial identity have to do with white feminism? Because those are both racial identities. You're asking a question of how do race and gender uh, work together in expressions of feminism. And I would also encourage us to broaden this discussion so we're not just talking black, white, because that is very much an American uh, frame, right? So we need to have other people in this conversation around building whatever a feminist agenda would or would not be that is truly um, reflexive of the groups who are, in it, who are in it. So I'm gonna encourage you to just take the question and push it bigger than the way you're asking it, all right, in those directions. And to start with that, that initial question you just asked, but to push yourself to think less about these finished comparisons, you know, black women do this and white women do that kind of thing, to a space of 
What are the issues and concerns that have been raised within multiple forms of feminism? What are the ways in which they overlap? What are the ways in which they diverge? What accounts for those differences and those similarities? What does that mean? Okay. That's well, a little more than perhaps you asked for, but if you were a student in my class, that's what I'd make you do. <laughs> there would be homework. <laughs> I'd be okay with that. <laughs> yes. Hello. Um, I'm really glad to, that you're here, by the way. But, um, oh no, I'm about to read a quote for you. Um, yeah, this is, um, I have read so many things about feminism in general, and I just have a question. I, I read a quote by um, Lori Penny, I don't know if you're familiar with her, but um, the idea that women might not place pleasing men at the center of our politics, consciously or unconsciously, makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Sometimes it makes them angry. I am regularly asked whether I think that feminism ought to be rebranded in order to threaten men less, because anything a woman does, even attempt to chip away at a massive, slow-grinding superstructure of se sexism, must appeal to men first, or it is meaningless. And I think um, Dimitri, I think he framed this question really well. Like You say you're a feminism, and even um, women are mystified or angry at hearing that term. And I was wondering, what's the brand of feminism that we're working with today? We're working against a word that we may not get to use. Language is very powerful. And one of the ways you can contain a feminist movement is to completely derogate the term feminism repeatedly to the point where people are afraid to use it. So the whole question of why are you afraid of a word? The way I used to teach my class, Black Feminist Thought, Black Feminism, was, um, in fact, that's how I wrote the book, Black Feminist Thought, was I taught everything in that book sort of like African-American women and, and, you know, slavery, African-American women and work, African-American women and sexuality. I mean, I went through every single thing, reproductive issues, this, that, and the other. And my students said, we're there with you. Yes, we get this. This is really it. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, it's all in there. The intersectionality. The last class I had was on black feminism and white feminism. And they were waiting for that class. Because what they wanted was, finally, we're going to find out what that white feminism is now that we know what the black feminism is. I said, well, they didn't know it was black feminism. They thought it was just black women's issues. The last class was going to be on black feminism. And they were ready to jump on the black feminists, who they thought was some kind of version of sell out black women to white women. I don't know what they thought. But by the time we got to the last class, I said, you know, now you've been asking me what black feminism is. Everything that I've taught you is, in fact, black feminism. Totally confused. They looked at me like, that was so tricky, Dr. Collins. That was tricky. <laughs> I said, the point is, I want you to think about what is, who benefits if you run away from the ideas that are associated with this term? Who benefits? And if you want to use a placeholder term, that's okay with me. And all these women who say, I'm a womanist, I'm not a black feminist, the same exact same things. All right? So the notion of what were close, close enough. What, why are you afraid of the word? It's really interrogating the power relations that create these particular relations. I would also disagree with this person around a feminism that puts pleasing men in the center. I don't necessarily think that's what a lot of women do. I certainly don't think that's what lesbians do. No. All right, so I mean, I, you, know, I, you know, they've been pretty prominent, you know, so it's kind of, so it's this notion of maybe within heterosexual women, certain groups of heterosexual women, et cetera, et cetera, you know, but there are a lot of, I mean, women are just, there's a range among women. Um, and the whole notion of, if that, that's one group's issue, how to get beyond pleasing men, all right? That's not everybody's issue. Nope. <laughs> that's exactly what I mean about these conversations that need to occur. Those are the kinds of things that get hammered out, all right? I think, but I was just curious then, why, why is somebody so offended by Dimitri being a feminist though? Like, what is Dimitri getting from <laughs> feminism? Like, I think they're afraid of it. I don't think they're offended. I mean, what's the, where's, what's the offense? <laughs> You see, if people do not, what is the fear of somebody who, who statistically is really a minority that has, if you're, if you're strong in your masculinity and non-feminism, why are you worried about him, you see? If you're strong in your heterosexism, why are you worried about gay marriage? If you're strong, I mean, th these things are far more symbolic of gatekeeping then we usually give them credence. So that's what this is all about, because these are guys that are gonna have, I think I'm assuming it's guys, could be women too, that say, I'm gonna have to think about myself differently if you stay this way. And I don't wanna do that, so you have to change. And he's gonna have to say, don't think so. That's when it gets interesting.
Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Last person? Yes. I? I, I like being first. <laughs> it's okay. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, I do have a question. Um, one, I appreciated the comments you made about um, academia translating into activism. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a question um, about how does that happen today? I work in a community with um, people who don't have opportunity to go to college. So when I'm looking at books and documentaries and things to show to talk about, feminism and breaking down patriarchy, all of it is in such academic terms and language mm -hmm. that I don't know um, how to present these things um, without you know, having to sit there and translate each book oh, no, or, no, no. right. That's it. What? what? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's what you have to do. You know, when I talk about education as a site of political action, this is exactly what I mean. I'm not talking about teaching in schools and how to change the curriculum. That's part of it. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about education, where you really educate somebody to be free and to own ideas and to understand ideas and be empowered by them, that's teaching. Okay. And then you've got to figure out how to translate the big ideas that are worth it for them and hear them so you, you think back to those big ideas to see whether they're all, all that you thought they were. Mm -hmm. And you become really important as a translator in between. We need far more people like that who aren't necessarily saying, I'm speaking for the people and that, you know, it's kind of unmediated, right. or I'm speaking for, you know, for the academy, that's unmediated. So that's the hard thing. That's the hard work. And there are wonderful people out there doing that. I mean, there's a young man who wrote to me from Baltimore. He sent me a clip of his students because he took my book, Black Feminist Thought, and he basically, and one of his students used it in their debating team. You know, this is one of these African-American inner city debate teams. And he sent me the clip of her debating. And she was debating, you know, ain't I a woman? And, I, and she was talking about Afrocentric feminist epistemology. And she knew what she was talking about. It was really fascinating to me. She was doing a better job than some of my students. How she owned that material. Now, somebody had to help her with that. Right. But the point is, that's what he did, you see. So I see when you open people's eyes, you're not responsible for the decisions that they make or to fix things in their lives. But boy, access to something that is rich and big is really what people need because we dumb things down to people all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to you know, like bring people along. So you, what you were getting ready to throw away you know, like, well, short of translating it line by line, is exactly what you do. This is what I did when I worked in the community schools movement. Okay. This is how I learned African American studies. I, instead of my colleagues were in seminars reading Frantz Fanon, I'm going to be teaching this next week, the irony of it all, reading Frantz Fanon, The Wretched of the Earth, and I was teaching 7th and 8th graders. Now that language is really difficult. And what I was doing was looking at what's in that book and what's of relevance for them, and how will I talk to them about those ideas they can't read Fanon. And then what are the ideas that they're going to talk about that will inform my understanding of how I'm going to read Fanon? Mm. And that's how I read everything. What is of use to them? Not what is of, and to me, not what is of use to, um, to my seminar. So I'm, I'm sort of like trying to impress somebody who really doesn't care about me. And that, that skill of translation is invaluable. That's exactly how I work, right at that space. Okay, so please go do that. <laughs> Thank you. All right? <laughs> is that these? Woohoo! <laughs>